we will gain a greater understanding of what mine, Pastor Scott's, and every other pastor across the country who claims to be a pastor for Jesus Christ, what our responsibility is. Um, I, I think probably through this you're going to learn some things. I think probably through this you're going to you're going to go, wow, I had no clue uh, that's what he was supposed to be doing. And I hope that by the end of this series, uh, you'll understand um, why I have the intensity uh, that I do. I know, I know our senior leadership knows the intensity that I have uh, for the things I do and um, for getting things done. Um, and, and sometimes, quite honestly, I can, uh, I can push and, and people get upset because I push. Um, and that's okay because at the end of the day, we have a huge responsibility. And even more so than that, I and Pastor Scott, as pastors, have even more responsibility. When we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, we have more to answer for. And I'm not letting you off the hook by making it sound like you don't have a lot to answer for as Christians because you do. But at the end of the day, pastors have a greater responsibility. And I understand that. Pastor Scott understands that. And we understand what we have to answer for. And to be quite honest, it's scary. And I hope that you will understand by the end of this series why... I push as hard as I do to get things done. Why I am so anxious and so uh, tenacious to see God work in our church and to see lives transformed. And why I why I keep telling you that you need to get involved. And Because I can't do this all on my own. I have a responsibility. But if everybody who is God's people won't step up and do their share, it's not going to work. And so the series is Pastor. The title of this morning's message is, What Does That Mean and What Does He Do? Uh, this series is going to start in Ezekiel 34. It's the Old Testament. And, and so we need to all keep in mind the consequences are for a shepherd or a pastor. And, and that does not mean... Um, as we look at this passage out of Ezekiel... I want you to think and understand why I have the heart for you folks that do. Not only the tenacity and the desire to get things done, but, but the heart that I have to see lives transformed. And I want you to know, if you don't know it already, I genuinely care about each and every one of you. I genuinely care that you grow in Christ, that if you're not saved, that you will be saved. That if you are saved, that you will grow and you will, you're, you're, you'll fight the battles you fight with the power of Christ. And, and you, will, you will live on the mountaintop. Because I do have that heart for each of you. Pastor Scott has that same heart. And that is the heart of a pastor. That is the heart that God calls pastors to have. Jesus said that a good shepherd would leave 99 sheep to go get one, right? 99 to go get one. That is how serious God takes the calling of pastor. There are many reasons why I want you to understand what God says about the responsibilities of pastor. There are many reasons why I want you to understand what my responsibilities are, what Pastor Scott's responsibilities are. What every pastor who claims the, the name of Christ, what our responsibilities are. But I think for me, the most important thing I want you to know is to give you some insight as to why I tick the way I do. What keeps me going? What keeps me motivated when at the end of the day I get frustrated or things happen and I get upset or it doesn't seem like we're making progress or, you know, at the end of the day, I understand what I have to answer for. And that's what keeps me moving. That's what keeps me going. And I hope you guys can understand that by the time we get done with this series. I want to give you a little insight into some of the things that pastors have to deal with. Listen to this story. 
The story is told of a small country church where the pastor called a special meeting of the congregation to approve the purchase of a brand new chandelier. Brand new chandelier. Doesn't that sound nice? Country church, brand new chandelier. After some discussion of the pros and cons of purchasing a new chandelier, an old farmer stood up and he said, buying a new chandelier seems like a good idea to you, <laughs> but I'm against it for three reasons, the old farmer said. First of all, it's too expensive and we can't afford it. Second, there isn't anybody around here who knows how to play one. <laughs> and thirdly, Pastor, what we really need in this church is a new light fixture. <laughs> Seems funny, doesn't it? But there's a lot of hidden truths in that little story of what pastors have to deal with. Pastor's job is one of the most is the and I say job very lightly because it's not a job, it's a calling. We're going to see that here in a few minutes. But a, what a pastor has to deal with is one of the hardest things in the world. If you've never been a pastor, you have no clue what it's like to get a call at 1.30 in the morning saying somebody's in the hospital and we need you there right away because so-and-so is about to die. And you've got 20 people waiting for you to have a word from the Lord to lift them up. That you're supposed to be the, the rock that these people turn to. Jesus is our rock, but we look to human beings to help comfort us, don't we? You have no idea what it's like to go to a meeting and people just rebuke every idea that God has given a pastor. And you see the vision that God has for the people of this church. And, and you see the vision of what God has called the church to. And when, when you bring it up, people start fighting. People start bickering. Because at the end of the day, people want what? Control. You have no idea what it's like to see God say, okay, we need to do this ministry. And then no one in the church supports it. Even though God said to do this. Being a pastor is the hardest thing. It is the hardest calling any man can ever receive. And we have greater responsibility when we stand before the Lord. When we stand before God. Our theme verse for the series out of Ezekiel. Please stand now so we can read this together. If you are ready. Ezekiel 34 verses 1 through 10. And we're going to read these through this series. And at the end of the series, what I'm going to do is look at this and see what the consequences are of an uncommitted pastor. Let's read together. And then the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to those shepherds, Thus says the Lord God, Woe, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fat sheep without feeding the flock. Those who are sickly you have not strengthened. The diseased you have not healed. The broken you have not bound up. The scattered you have not brought back, nor have you sought for the lost, but with force and with severity you have dominated them. They were scattered for lack of a shepherd, and they became food for every beast of the field, and were scattered. My flock wandered through all the mountains and on every high hill. My flock was scattered over all the surface of the earth, and there was no one to search or seek for them. Therefore, you shepherds, Hear the word of the Lord. As I live, declares the Lord God, surely because my flock has become a prey, my flock has even become food for all of the field for lack of a shepherd. My shepherds did not search for my flock, but rather the shepherds fed themselves and did not feed my flock. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, 
I am against the shepherds and I will demand my sheep from them and make them cease from feeding sheep. May God add His blessings to reading and hearing of His Word. You may be seated. That's some tough words. That's some very tough words for shepherds. And this is what God says about an uncommitted pastor. And at the end of this series, we're going to look through each of these verses. And we're going to look at what happens to an uncommitted pastor. And so this morning, what does a pastor mean? Oh, sorry, I didn't finish reading. So the shepherds will not feed themselves anymore, but I will deliver my flock from their mouth. So they, they will not be food for them. So our first point this morning, what does pastor mean? What does this word pastor mean? You call me Pastor Casey, you call him Pastor Scott, but do you understand, do you understand, do you realize what this word really means? What is a pastor? Ephesians 4.11 And he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. The Greek word for pastor is poime, P-O-Y-M-A-N-E. And it literally means shepherd. The word pastor literally means shepherd. And so I've been read in Ezekiel 34, verses 1 through 10. God was talking about the shepherds or the pastors in Israel. So when you hear the word pastor, think of a shepherd. Think of a shepherd who leads a flock. Who takes care of uh, sheep or goats or cows. Today we don't call them shepherds. What do we call them today? Farmers, right? Isn't it fitting that we're starting BPS with the farmer series? Isn't that cool? God's cool like that. Everybody know God's cool? Amen. Yeah. I hope you know that. The literal translation for pastor from the Greek and the Hebrew is shepherd. So that tells you the heart that God expects for men who fill this, possession, this position to have. This is the heart that God has for pastors, which is a shepherd. A shepherd in ancient times cared for the flock. He, he, he cared enough to risk his own life. A pastor, no. A shepherd in the Old Testament cared enough to risk their life for the flock. If a wolf or a lion would come, the shepherd wouldn't stand and, and just watch as the wolf or the lion comes and attacks the sheep. The shepherd would stand with his stick and fight. Now we don't have the, the, the real lions and the real wolves and uh, you know those things coming and attacking you guys. We, we don't see any lions lurking outside, right? But what we do have is we have wolves in sheep's clothing. We have lions. Um, Satan is called a lion, seeking whom he may devour. And so what we see is the proverbial lion or wolf. It is pastor's jobs to look what is coming, to see what is coming. And, and I can tell you, God is showing us what is coming through His Word. That is why I'm so adamant. That is why I keep harping on us to get on fire, to get ready to grow in our faith because bad times are coming. I can prepare you. I can tell you. I can show you what's coming. But it takes each and every one of you to be sold out and to get on fire. In ancient times, the shepherd gave his own life for the flock. So, what did God expect for a shepherd to do in the Old Testament? A shepherd is a person who tends to the sheep. That 1.30 call, 1.30 a.m. call to go to the hospital. The pastor doesn't have the, the privilege, I guess we could, but God says we don't. We don't have the privilege to say, hey, you know what? Call me in the morning. Let me know how it goes. No, what does a pastor do? A pastor goes. Even after they've worked all day, even after they've been ministering to 25 other people and they're on their cell phone texting people, ministering to them, they're taking calls, they're doing all these different things. They get that call 1.30, they're tired. 
true pastor gets up and goes to the hospital when they're called. That's tending to the sheep. Even if they're not asked to go, the heart of a shepherd says, I'm going to go. The heart of a shepherd of a pastor says, I'm going to be there and tend to my sheep. As the church grows, can the pastor be there for everybody? No. That is why I'm developing leaders underneath me who can then be there for other people. And they develop leaders to be there for other people. Because you can only be in so many places at, so much, at, so many, at, at one time. I can't be everywhere and do everything. And that's why I'm developing leaders that can help share that. And so pastors, shepherds, tend to the sheep. Sometimes that means taking the crook of that staff that the shepherd has and pulling them back when they uh, aren't doing things they should be doing. But boy, in 2016, God's sheep today don't like being corrected, do we? No, nobody's going to tell me what I'm going to do or what I did wrong. Who does that pastor think he is to tell me what I did was wrong? Well, I don't think I'm anybody, but what I am is a pastor. And God says I have to tend to the flock. And sometimes that means dealing with situations that I don't like dealing with, that you don't like dealing with. I could be a coward and run and, and stick my head in the sand, but guess what? I'm going to answer for it. When I stand before my Lord, He's going to say, you allowed this to happen, and you looked the other way. Why didn't you deal with it? You were too worried about what that person was going to think. You offended me instead of that person. So we got to tend to the sheep. A shepherd feeds the sheep. I pray that you guys are getting fed under Pastor Scott and myself's uh, pastorship here. I hope you guys are getting fed. I hope you guys are learning. We are certainly trying. We're giving you Wednesday night. We're not just giving you milk. We're not giving you fluff and fill. We're giving you the Word of God and we're giving meat. If you're not going under us, it's not my fault, it's not his fault, it's not God's fault, it's your fault. Because we're giving you what needs, what, what you need. And so we got to feed you guys. That means, guess what? That means we got to study. That means we got to feed ourselves. It takes time, it takes an investment. But we got to do it. A shepherd guards the flock of sheep. When we see an enemy coming, we got to stand in the way. That means we're going to get beat up. That means we're going to get bruised. Trust me, I've been beat up and bruised more than you know. That's okay. God bless you. That's okay because God tells me to do it. God tells me to. So I've gotten beat up. I've gotten bruised. I've gotten kicked in the kneecaps. Anybody watch NCIS? Yeah, a lot of people. Man, that's a cool show. You know the old Gibbs on the nose of slapping back in the head? <laughs> I've gotten that a bunch too. It's okay. I'll keep doing it until God calls me home. Because I'd much rather take those beatings here and stand before my Lord. As we see in that verse, Ephesians 4.11, it's a, it's a gifting. It's a gift to be a pastor. Um, you know, you guys hear me all the time talk about all the stuff we've got to go through and how hard it is. But I tell you what, God has a way of making all of that just disappear, melt away. I was sitting in my office this morning for service. 13 year old girl walks in. Back. I said, what's that? She said, it's for you. I said, what? He hands me the bag. There's a card in this life. Thank you, card. He said, thanks for all you do. Couldn't ask for a better pastor. He said, be careful, I don't break. It's a glass for us. my desk if you want to see it. Pastors are the most unappreciated. Kicked around. Position, job, calling, whatever you want to call it. 
when someone does something like that, it takes all that away. It takes all that away. Pastor is a calling, it's a gift. It's a gift. There's no way that every Christian could be a pastor. Anybody ever heard the old saying, too many chiefs and not enough Indians? If every, if every Christian was a pastor like this, in this role of pastor of a church, there would be too many chiefs and not enough Indians. Not every Christian is gifted with being a pastor. And so it's a gifting, it's a calling. Being a pastor is not a job. It is not something that someone chooses to go into. And people do it. They go into seminary thinking, man, this is going to be easy. Those are the people who quit. Those are the people that when people are attacking you for trying to do what God wants, they say, this ain't worth it. And they're the ones who run away. Because you guys know how much money I make. And if it was a job, let me tell you something. It's not worth it. The hours I put in, the things I go through, it's not worth the money I get paid. This is not a job. This is a calling. It is a gift. It is a gift. It is a calling. So why did God ordain this position of pastor? Why did God create and ordain this position? I'm not going to read it to you. Write it down and read it for yourselves this week. Ephesians 4, 12-15. Please write it down and read it this week. Uh, God uses, through this verse, God uses pastors to help the church become what God wants the church to be. Okay? God puts pastors in churches to, to mold the church, to lead the church, to kick the church in the butt if that's what we got to do, to get the church where God wants it to be. And the reason God ordained these positions, positions mentioned is for the following reasons. One, the perfecting of the saints. That's you. If you're a Christian, God calls you a saint. You don't have to go through the Catholic Church and be blessed in whatever they do to create a saint. Scripture teaches that believers are saints. Some of you go, boy, if Pastor knew how I live, he wouldn't be calling me a saint. Maybe so. But God calls you a saint. Because if you're a believer, if you're a born again believer, God calls you a saint. So my job, Pastor Scott's job, is to help you become like Christ. To help perfect you. To become like Christ. We're called in the ministry of the local church and outside. Ministry is serving. That's what ministry is. Is serving. We're called to serve. We're called to serve in the church and outside the church. Too many pastors do the inside the church and they forget about the outside of the church. But we are called as pastors and as a church to minister inside and outside the church. <clears throat> and we are also called to get the flock to help in ministry. You know, there's too many churches expect a pastor, well, we pay you, you should be doing all the work. Guess what? It ain't going to happen. That's right. Don't ever, if I'm here, don't ever expect me to do all the work. That's not the way the gospel teaches. That's not the way God teaches the church to run. Pastor Scott and I are going to lead you in efforts to get you to do ministry so then you can lead other people in efforts to do ministry. We are all called to do ministry together. We're called to build up the church. That's what edification is called. We're called to build up the church. It takes all of us, not just us pastors. We're supposed to lead the efforts. We are called to raise mature, biblically sound Christians. Do you realize that a pastor is going to answer to God for how they teach and preach and raise Christians? You know, part of, part of what so many pastors don't do, they don't want to say the hard things to people because they're afraid of offending them because they have a job that they want to keep. Well, if I'm not telling you the hard things that's teaching you the biblical principles, guess what? I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do. And I'm going to answer for it. So I want you guys to see this and understand, okay, when he's talking to me about these things and he's telling me these things, it's not because he's trying to be mean. He's got a pig in his stomach when he does this. 
Which I do, by the way. I hate dealing with that kind of stuff. But I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Because I don't want to answer. Because I don't want to answer. God doesn't want to keep Christians babies in Christ. He doesn't want you to sit there and just keep drinking milk your whole Christian life. He wants you to grow up and become mature. Become a biblically sound Christian. And He doesn't want a church to stay stale. If, if a church is just babies, it's not growing and it's not doing the work of Christ. God wants the church to grow. He wants us to love others. He wants us to minister to others. And He wants people to come to salvation. And that requires biblically sound Christians to do it. God wants you to be instruments wherever He calls you and whenever He calls you. And it's our job to teach you that. It's our job to show you that. One of our jobs that people don't like anymore is to oversee. Oversee the church. Acts 20.28 20, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. To shepherd the church of God which He purchased with His own blood. So we know this is talking to pastors because it says to shepherd the church who are to shepherd shepherds, pastors and we're called overseers. Now this is not something that many churches in America like today. The Greek word is episkopos for overseer. That is the Greek word for episkopos or for overseers, episkopos. And it means this, an officer in genitive case charge of or or the church. Literally or figuratively. Figuratively. Bishop or overseer. So in the New Testament, when you see bishop or overseer or presbyter, those are the same words. And they mean overseer. And it's relating to pastors. Overseer. Not do everything, but to oversee. We see things that are lacking, we leave the church. We see God's vision, we leave the church. We oversee and we make sure things are getting done. We make sure that, that people are growing. This is called being a leader. So many churches don't want pastors to be leaders. They just want them to be yes or no men and women. Do what we say. Go where we tell you. Call who we tell you to call. Visit when I say to visit. Nowhere in the Scriptures does it say that's the way a church is run. Nowhere. Pastors are overseers. Pastors are making sure that things are getting done, things are happening, things are moving forward. So when we ask you, hey, is this getting done? You said you were going to do this. We're called to be accountable ourselves and we're called to hold each other accountable. You think we like going to people who say they're committed to something and not do it and say, hey, you said you're going to do this, why didn't you do it? You think we like that? No, we don't. But we're called to hold each other accountable. We're called. God tells us to do that. So what are the qualifications of this position? A pastor must be called into the ministry. 2 Timothy 1.9. I'm not going to read them for the sake of time, but please look these up this week. A pastor is called by God. I already mentioned this. It's not something we choose, trust me. <laughs> I would never have chosen this. Would you agree, Pastor Scott? Amen. I would have never chosen to be a pastor if I had the choice. It is a calling God calls pastors. And you got to think about that. When we talk bad about pastors, we talk bad about men and women of God. Do you realize you're putting down and you're slamming someone who's called by God to do something? Have you ever thought about that? When you're slamming me, you're slamming Pastor Scott, or you're slamming so-and-so? 
you are called by God. A pastor must be enabled by God to do the work that he was set out to do. 1 Timothy 1.12 And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful putting me into the ministry. I don't know if anybody's ever paid attention or thought about it when someone tells me, great sermon, man, good job. Thank the Lord. Because trust me, it ain't me. It ain't me. I bumble and I fumble. It's Him. We have to rely on God to work through us. If a pastor's trying to do things themselves, it's going to mess up. If you as Christians are trying to do things yourself, don't mess up. It ain't going to work. It ain't going to be the best it could be. The pastor must be ready to preach the Word of God. 2 Timothy 4.2 tells us that we must be ready to preach. We must be ready. You know, the problem is, in today's world, and I am part of the problem, we've got these nice sermons we do. A couple funny illustrations, three points, and an introduction, and then, and, and we're ready on Sunday mornings. But what about when God tells me at the Salvation Army to preach? I got to be ready. I got to be ready. Anytime God says preach, we preach. You got to be ready. I really pray uh, I really pray that each of you don't feel this way that this little girl did in this story there was once a little uh, pastor had a little five year old daughter and now the little girl noticed that every time her dad stood behind the pulpit and he was getting ready to preach he would bow his head for a moment before he began to preach the little girl noticed that he did this every time. So one day, after the service, she goes, Dad! And the little five, five-year-old voice, Why do you bow your head before you preach? The little five-year-old asks. And he says, Well, honey, I asked the Lord to help me preach. She stares up at her dad and goes, Why hasn't the Lord helped you? <laughs> I pray you guys don't feel that way about mine and Pastor Scott's preaching. Let me ask you something. Is age a factor to be a pastor? Do you have to meet a certain requirement? In the Old Testament, a rabbi, a teacher, a priest couldn't be a priest, rabbi, or teacher until they were 30 years old. In the Old Testament, there was an age requirement. That's why we know that Jesus was... 33 and a half to 34 years old when he died because he couldn't publicly start teaching until he was 30 years old. And we read through the scriptures and see that he went through three Passovers. Does that put him at 33 years old? Is there an age requirement in the New Testament? Do you have to be a certain age, so young or so old, and you're done? Pastor Scott shaking his head no, and he's absolutely right. 1 Timothy 4.12 tells us Paul told Timothy, he said, don't let anybody despise your youth. Timothy was young, and yet he was a pastor. I've been there. I've been pastoring for a decade now. So, I've been there. I know what it's like when people look at you like, this young punk doesn't know what he's doing. Who are you to tell me I've been a Christian for 50 years? Yeah, and you're still a baby, just like you were 50 years ago when you got saved. Paul told Timothy, don't let anybody hold your age against you. So there is no age requirement. Can you be too old to get called into the ministry? No. Because guess what? If you've been called into the ministry, you were called into the ministry before you were born. You've just been running from it since you were born. You've rejected the calling Christ has given you. But we need to support our young pastors. Our young preachers. We need to support our young people. Let me, let me share one more story with you this morning. A newly appointed young preacher was contacted by the local funeral director to hold a graveside service. He didn't know the gentleman. 
uh, it was a small country cemetery. It was out in the middle of nowhere in Iowa. And there wasn't a big funeral, no funeral, just a committal service, okay? And because sadly the deceased had no family or friends in Iowa, the young pastor started early to the cemetery, but he got lost in the back roads. Finally found his way, and he gets to the, to the grave site, and he, he gets out. It was an hour late. There was no hearse. There was the men working that were workers sitting by a tree uh, eating their lunch. So he goes to the open grave. He found that the vault lid was already on. He took out his book and read the service, even though there was no one there, no hearse, no family, no funeral director, nothing. As he returned to the car, one of his workmen paused from biting in the sandwich, and he said, Hey, I think we should have told him that's the septic tank. <laughs> we need to be there. Because I can tell you, when you're young in the ministry, it's hard. You doubt yourself. You second guess yourself. You wonder, oh my heavens, am I doing the right thing? Should I be doing this? Should I be doing that? You, you have more questions than you have answers. <laughs> no, no, please. No. We need to support our people. We need to support our pastors. We need to support our people stepping up in leadership roles. Because I'm telling you, it is not easy. It is not easy. And we need to understand that pastors are humans. Guess what? We make mistakes. We have bad days and th say things we shouldn't say. We get offended just like you. We get upset. There's days where I don't want to leave my house. I just want to sit on the couch kick up the recliner, and binge watch NCIS. <laughs> One day Shelly asked me, she goes, how do you do that? I said, it's the only escape I have. I can shut everything else off in this world for that time and just get lost. You guys need to understand, we need time for ourselves too. We need time for our families. We need time to just unwind. Because it is a high call. It is a stressful calling. I've got more gray hairs in the last year than I had in the previous nine years. It's hard. There's a lot to answer for. There's a lot to remember. By the way, I usually do remember things. It's usually just a month afterwards. But it always comes around. So just remember that. If I told you I'll do something, I'll get to it. I'll get there. Pastor Scott tells you he'll do something, he'll get there. He'll get there. Just give us some room. Give us some understanding. Support us. Pray for us most of all. Have our backs when things aren't going well. Lift us up. Be there for us. Because you never know what it's like to walk in our shoes. You never know how hard it is. You never know how much more Satan attacks because of what we've been called to do. And so as we go through this week, I want you to remember that a pastor is more than somebody who just preaches. Okay? We have so much responsibility. We have so much on our plates. And I'm not saying this to complain or to get you to feel sorry for us. But I do want you to pray for us. I do want you to have understanding. And I do want you to remember that all we don't just download a sermon off the internet and preach it. God speaks to us and we got to develop these thoughts into sermons. To hear God. To oversee the church. Everything. I was talking to a 
guy who he, he's working with youth and at his church and he's complaining about how busy he was and I was like, dude, I've got to make sure that's going and 75 other things. The point is that we have a lot on our plates. Help us be ministers. Be there for us. We can get so much more done together than alone. Maybe this morning you don't know Jesus. Maybe this morning all this seems crazy to you. Let me tell you something today. Jesus died for you. Jesus willingly went to the cross. He was beaten. He was bloody. He hung for each and every one of you. And if you will, give your sins to Him. He will forgive you. He will give you salvation. Maybe today you're a Christian, but just not sold out. You're, you're just backslidden, living in a way you know is wrong. Maybe Satan's had control of you for too long. Today's the day to be sold out. Today's the day to say, you know what? I'm tired of living my life my way. All it's doing is great for heartache and struggles and strife. I'm going to be sold out. I'm going to let Christ have rule and reign in my heart, in my mind. Today's the day. Whatever your need is, Come to the altar. Let us pray. God, there's great need. So many people are hurting and so many people, uh, God, aren't living the way they should be even though they claim the name of Jesus. This life is more than just saying a prayer and then doing what you want. It's a commitment. It's living for You, no longer ourselves. No longer doing what we want to do, but what You tell us to do. So God, I pray for every Christian here who's not committed, who's not sold out for You, that they'll say, you know what, no more. I want to be sold out. I'm making a commitment today to God, to myself, and to my church. Father, if there's somebody that doesn't know Jesus today, I pray, God, for their soul. I pray for salvation. I pray, God, that they will decide to turn from their wicked ways. Turn to You. Father, Father, whatever the need, I pray people will come and get on their knees that we will start being the people of prayer. In the powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.